On August 14, 1966, Heinz Ramisch and Hermann Schreidel set out to climb the Petit Dru. The two had just met, along with other Germans, at the campground at the base of the mountain. Heinz was a 22-year-old student from Karlsruhe, Germany, and Hermann was an auto mechanic. They were both young, adventurous climbers and maybe a little overconfident for a climb of this magnitude. The needle stands on the Mont Blanc Massif on the French side of the border between France and Italy and comprises two peaks, the Grand and the Petit. One of the first to summit wrote that the mountain could be climbed in 16 to 18 hours from base to summit and back. And in good weather, it was difficult as both hands and both feet were always engaged. The difficulty, therefore, would be enormously increased if the rocks were glazed or cold. Furthermore, the mountain is never safe when snow is on the rocks. At such times, stones fall freely down the corridor. The Petit Dru was first summited in 1879 by the South Face and Southwest Ridge, and later in 1939 the North Face was conquered. During all of this time, the West Face was not even attempted as it was thought to be unclimbable. However, a few men proved this wrong when the West Face was conquered in 1952 using what could later be called the Magonet Route, named after one of the original 1952 climbers, Guido Magonet. Furthermore, in 1962, Americans Gary Hemming and Royal Robbins were the first to climb the West Direct, which would later be named the American Direct. Over the years, rock falls have destroyed most of these routes, but our story is from 1966, when two Germans decided to attempt the West Face in an ice storm. When the two young Germans decided to climb this face, it had only been conquered for the first time 14 years before. Heinz and Hermann only planned on being on the mountain for two to three days, so they brought minimal supplies, only waterproof anoraks, down jackets, and a two-man bivy. They started on the morning of August 14th, and on the ascent, Heinz and Hermann made good progress. They worked their way up the first two-thirds of the mountain. This section was the easiest, and they took advantage of decent weather conditions at the time. The moisture was beginning to freeze on the face of the mountain, causing things to be a little bit more difficult. At the end of the first day, they huddled into their two-man sack and slept for the night, with their clothes soaked and miserable. On the second day, Herman was leading the ascent when he took a bad fall on the wet rocks. He slammed against the rocks, bruising his ribs. He decided to continue on through the pain, and they kept climbing, but this slowed their progress. Also, Heinz was dealing with a bout of dehydration. He had a sore throat and could barely talk, but he also decided to continue on. The two men made their way up the extremely difficult face until the end of the second day. That night, they hunkered down in their two-man bivy below the dihedral. The next morning, as they climbed higher, they ignored the ominous clouds that moved in. They had to bivouac through a horrendous thunderstorm that thrashed the climbers around most of the day. When the thunderstorm let up, they decided to continue up the dihedral. With ice pelting them and freezing to the face of the mountain, they made slow progress. They made their way up the famous 90-meter dihedral. The dihedral consists of two wall faces, jointly forming a near right angle. This particular dihedral is about 90 meters, hence the 90-meter dihedral. With ice pelting them and freezing to the face of the mountain, they made slow progress until Herman slipped and fell again. Heinz caught him and badly cut his hands. The storm didn't let up. Late that afternoon, they arrived at the pendulum. They crossed the pendulum knowing that they could not come back down. It had taken nearly all day to traverse the 90-meter dihedral. They knew if they crossed the pendulum, they would not be able to come back. They crossed and found a small ledge to rest on. They now had three options. They could cross to the north face using the Magonet ladder, which may be impossible in this weather, continue up the overhangs to the summit, or they could give up. But giving up didn't mean retreating. They would have to call a rescue team to come get them off the face of the mountain. Given the conditions and the face of the mountain that they were on, a helicopter could not be provided. A rescue team would have to come up the mountain and help them back down. They lay in their two-man bivy until they could see camp below. Then they took out their red jacket and waved it furiously over their heads in the air, signaling the Germans at base camp. This signal launched what would be called the most complicated rescue attempt in the history of mountain climbing.
On August 18th, two days after the Germans had become stranded, news of the stranded climbers was spreading throughout the area in newspapers and climbing magazines, as well as on television broadcasts. Gary Hemming was in a small town on the Italian side in Cormayor. He was depressed from the death of his longtime close friend, John Harlan. John Harlan had died from a fall on the north face of the Eiger just a few months before. Gary Hemming and John Harlan trained and assisted mountain rescue organizations, INSA, and the Fritsch Alpine Troops. Gary had previously been a member of INSA until they collaborated on a rescue in 1961. Gary and Harlan accused the French rescuers of being lackluster, which obviously caused a rift between the French climbers and the Americans. Gary was later booted out of an INSA course in 1962 for refusing to shave his unruly beard. It was also very well known that Gary had a difficult and sometimes violent personality, adding to the discord between the groups of climbers. He would start fights that he knew he couldn't win and get pummeled. At other times, he had a cool, carefree demeanor, and at this time was considered the beatnik of climbing. On August 18th, Gary was reading a newspaper story of the stranded climbers. The story accounted the location of the climbers and the rescue attempt by the French Alpine troops that he had a rocky history with. The French Alpine troops had dispatched 40 climbers to the summit where they planned to lower a steel winch and haul the climbers up. Gary was the first to traverse the American direct route, which connected the Old West Face route with the dihedral where the German climbers were stranded. Gary knew this location possibly better than anyone. He had an intimate knowledge of the location of the German climbers and knew that the proposed extraction would most likely fail because of the overhang on the west face. Gary and his climbing partner, Lothar Mott, had paid the relatively expensive fee to travel from Chamonix through the tunnel, and Gary was now trying to convince Mott to return to rescue the stranded climbers. However, they had just come off the mountain, and Mott was cold, wet, and tired. Also, they were in a cafe watching the rain outside and could see that the weather was getting worse. Gary stated, This rescue is a great ascent, a real adventure. But what's important is that it involves the lives of two persons, two companions. If we make it, it will mean a lot more than just another windy summit. He also added that every news outlet in Western Europe was covering the story. It also meant a lot of fame for the rescuers. The stranded climbers also caught the attention of possibly the best and most famous alpinist, René de Maison. He made the fourth ascent of the west face of the Petit Drou was the first to perform the winter ascent and performed a solo ascent. If Gary Hemming represented a somewhat haphazard approach to climbing, then De Masson was the exact opposite. He was a very calculated and professional climber. He was also the foremost guide in the Alps and was employed by Chamonix's company of guides. But De Masson was very well known in the area and was friends and colleagues with many of the 40 climbers that were already on the mountain. Since John Harlan's death on the north face of the Eiger, the company Paris Match stationed reporters in Chamonix just waiting for rescue and death stories on the mountains. Without notifying his employer, De Masson signed a contract with Paris Match to accompany his team to rescue the climbers and cover the story. The route that he had planned to attack the mountain was exactly the same route as Gary Hemmings. Gary assembled a team at the Paris Hotel in Chamonix, where all the climbers stayed. Gerhard Bauer was a German in his early 20s who had a vested interest in helping as he was friends with Heinz and Hermann stuck on the mountain. Giles Bodine was a French guide. Mick Burke was a small British climber who would later go missing on Everest. He was also the most experienced for this particular challenge. Previously, when his climbing partner had broken his arm, he had repelled the American direct. The plan was to go up the original route to the German climbers and repel the American direct. Therefore, Mick was the most qualified for this challenge. The final member of the six-man team was Francois Guillaume. At just 22 years old, he was the least experienced, but was already well known as being an extremely strong climber. At 7 o'clock that night, the teams boarded a cog railway train that took them up the first leg of the glacier to the base of the corridor. The next morning, in blinding wind and sleet, they began their ascent of the corridor. They didn't make it very far before the conditions forced them back. It was covered with snow, causing stones and falling ice to bear down on them, making the conditions extremely dangerous, much too dangerous to continue. At the same time, de Maison and Merci 
a guide in training, tagged on as a cameraman to document the great rescue. They had been dropped off by helicopter at the base of the corridor and also attempted to ascend with the same result. They also took shelter below a ledge and waited out the storm. The next morning, it was cold enough that the face had frozen, and the Demasson team and Hemings team were able to traverse the face and they joined forces. They were now a team of eight. Gary was there to achieve more than just conquering a mountain. He was there to save other climbers' lives. Demasson was there for money and fame which he now needed both of, considering he was surely going to be fired from his employer for signing the contract with Paris Match behind his employer's back. Off the team went with Guillaume and Gary leading the way, with De Maison's team behind them, with Mock, Bauer, Bodine, and Burke hauling the heavy equipment behind them. They put the 22-year-old Guillaume up front, knowing that he would move extremely fast, forcing the others to keep up. This was a strategy to get up the mountain as fast as they possibly could. By now, Insa had gathered a team of eight climbers that were headed up Pierre Alain's route on the north face. The 40 volunteers, troops, and guides of the French guide troop were still at the peak trying to lower the steel cable, and by the end of the day on the 20th, Gary and Demon were bivouacked just 300 feet below the Germans. The Insa team was bivouacked at the same height just around the corner on the northwest face. There were three rival teams closing in on the Germans, and there were over 10 million people following the coverage of the rescue below. Whoever got to the Germans first would be instantly rich and famous. The next morning, Gary shouted up to the Germans, and they responded. Gary's team climbed the dihedral, while the Insa team crossed from the north face. A man by the name of Wolfgang Igle was a volunteer for the French guide troop team, and a friend of Heinz and Hermann stuck on the ledge. He was rappelling on the north face just above the Insa team when he lost his footing on the ice-covered face. He became entangled in the ropes with one wrapping around his neck. He was strangled by the rope hanging off the face of the mountain. They didn't have the equipment to retrieve him at the time. His body was left hanging on the side of the mountain to be retrieved at a later date. At noon on August 21st, Gary's team reached the ledge and found the two exhausted, cold, and hungry climbers still alive. E. Viard, an Insa climber, was crossing from the north face to the west when De Maison reached the stranded Germans. Yves was a colleague of De Maison and had climbed with him on Janu. He was furious that De Maison had not only gone off with this rogue team to rescue the Germans, but had hired a crew to document it. The two men got into an argument right there on the face of the mountain. This argument may have led to one of the most contentious tragedies in the Alps to this date. The North Face climbers of Insa were very upset with De Maison, including a climber named Gerard de Vesseau. He would later be tasked with rescuing De Maison, which would lead to great controversy when he would be accused of intentionally dragging out the rescue. Regardless of their hurt feelings at this point, they had two German climbers that they needed to get down off the mountain. Everyone knew at this point that the safest way to get the Germans down was to rappel down the American route, which was Gary's plan. So even if Eve tried to get De Maison to hand over the climbers, he knew that it wasn't going to happen. The climbers just needed to get the exhausted Germans down the mountain. They roped up and began their descent. As the weather cleared up for just a moment, it was just long enough for a camera crew aboard a helicopter to take some pictures. However, as the weather cleared, they could see ominous clouds on the horizon headed their way. Guillaume stated that the cloud ceiling was now about 11,800 feet. The air seemed humid. In spite of the altitude, it did not seem cold. It was obviously only a matter of time before the storm broke. They now had a 900 meter rappel below them, which was an enormous task at the time, and now they also knew that they were going to have to manage this rappel in a storm. They prepared the Germans with the modern nylon harness and lowered themselves to the, the bivouac below the dihedral where they had spent the previous night. The storm rolled through and battered the climbers, thrashing them about on the face of the mountain. The next day, on the 22nd, they were able to rappel down through the storm to the glacier where they were met by a helicopter. It was there that the Germans learned of their friend hanging off the north face of the mountain. He had given his life trying to save theirs.
The Germans would go on to make a full recovery. De Maison would receive the fandom that he sought, and Gary Hemming would receive the fandom that he did not seek. Gary moved back to the United States where he became extremely unhappy and depressed. On August 6, 1966, he was drunk and angry. He started a fight he knew he would lose and got pummeled. Then he got into a fight with his girlfriend and retreated alone to the forest where he put a bullet in his head. Gary Hemming will always be known as the American that led the team up the Petit Drew to save those two young Germans. He is known as Le Beatnik de Sim, the Beatnik of the Peaks. If you enjoyed the story, please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.